Welcome to The Real Python Podcast. This is episode 182. Have you thought of a way to improve the Python language? How do you share your idea with core developers and start a discussion in the Python community? Christopher Trudeau is back on the show this week, bringing another batch of PyCoders Weekly articles and projects. We consider a couple of Python syntax and functional ideas posted to the discussions on python.org. The first idea is for simplifying the syntax of a function's keyword arguments, and the second is for the ability to return a name tuple from a function. These threads reveal steps within the Python enhancement proposal process and the goal of finding a sponsor. Christopher covers a tutorial on building a JSON-like parser in Python. The project is a solid place to start if you want to learn about parsing and developing rules for recognizing syntax and extracting data. We also share several other articles and projects from the Python community, including a couple of release announcements and news items, how to build a hangman game for the command line in Python, why the Django admin is ugly, and how to customize it to differentiate admin environments, clearing up confusing Git terminology, a project to extract links from a remote HTML resource, and a regex crossword game. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Christopher, welcome back. Hey, the penultimate episode this year. Yeah. Yeah, actually, we're going to have kind of a fun episode where we haven't done this on the PyCoders version of the show, but we're talking about doing kind of a, a bit of a wrap-up episode hitting into the end of the year here. And I think that might be fun to do because it's you know slightly different content that we'll be sharing and highlighting as uh, super popular stuff this year. So excited to wrap up the year. Yep, I got the uh, real Python statistics on click-throughs for PyCoders. So uh, we even we even know what's most popular, and there's a few in there that I was surprised by. So uh, you know, <laughs> that's uh, what is that? Stay tuned. There's your hook. There you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so we got some news to dig into here. Yeah, a few odds and ends. Okay. Uh, so the first one is, I didn't even know what was happening, but PyPI has completed its first security audit. So this was done by a company called Trial of Bits, and they're a cybersecurity firm. And they did a code review of Warehouse, which is the PyPI site itself, and Cabotage. Yeah, beats me whether that's a clever th name or a typo. I'm not sure which, <laughs> uh, which is their, they've got like a custom container thing that they use for deployment. Trial of Bits went through and did analysis on both, both of these things. Uh, overall, the results were quite good. Uh, there were zero high severity advisories found altogether. And the lower severity ones that they have found that have actually already been addressed in the code. So uh, that's great. We've got a safer PyPI now for all of us. Nice. Yeah. A lot of effort happening there on security stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. yes, yeah. They're 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 definitely d digging in, and and I guess you know that's where uh, you know the the sponsorships here are helping that right. Uh, the fact yeah. that companies are putting money into uh, developers being able to work on these things makes a big difference. The second bit of news is the annual Python Developers Survey is ready for your input. We discussed the 2022 survey results not that long ago. I think it was episode yeah. 176. Uh, mm -hmm. So you fill in this year's, and if I do the math right, that means we'll be talking about the results in episode 224. Uh, so, <laughs> All right, don't hold me to that. <laughs> uh, so surveys like this do help groups like the Python Software Foundation to consider where to focus efforts. So the information is valuable. So take a few minutes and go fill that in. One quick note on that. It seems to be a little picky about your browser, so you might want to do a Firefox or a Chrome thing. It didn't like Safari. <laughs> I, I filled it in yesterday using Firefox and didn't have any problems, but great. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Safari yeah. was weird, as usual. So. Yeah. And then that last little bit of news here is a release announcement. Uh, Wagtail 5.2 is out. That's an LTS release, so it's going to be sticking around for a while. So if you're a Wagtail person, go upgrade. And in fact, 
they already did a security patch. So technically that's 5.2.1. Anyways, before handing the mic back here, I've got one non-news item that I came across this morning that I just kind of wanted to share. It's a bit too short for its own segment, uh, but I liked it enough just to not bring it up. So it's an article by Graham Voronov, and it's titled, How Many Python Core Devs Use Typing? What he's done is gone through a list of past and present core Python developers, looked up their other projects on places like GitHub, and then tallied up how many involve Python type hinting. So the numbers are kind of surprising. Of all the core devs he could find, about half of them actually have separate open source projects they maintain. That number actually seemed lower to me than I expected. I figured if you're giving your time to the Python community, you're probably doing others, but maybe they're too busy giving their time to core, so they don't have others. Yeah. Of those projects that he found, less than 40%, it was 39% used type hinting. And interestingly, if you only look at the subset of core devs who joined in the last three years, that number goes up to 76%. So there's a fairly strong correlation there between being a more recent dev and the desire to use type ins. Yeah. So it's not that I'm not a fan, it's that I'm too old. Uh, <laughs> Self-selecting uh, type hint usage. Self- <laughs> exactly. exactly. So uh, the article goes over the methodology he used and has some decent insights uh, if you're interested. But I, I just thought the uh, the information itself was kind of interesting and thought I'd share it. Yeah, it kind of makes me think a little bit about uh, that a lot of this is the personal projects and looking at, at them. And then I wonder, you know, like, are those... I mean, yes, they're on GitHub, but are they "quote unquote" for public consumption and um, uh, sure, things like and, that? Which is hard to factor. And, and, and you're never going to get a really good statistical piece here, as well, right? So, yeah. uh, you know, the if you look at when I look at my uh, repos on GitHub, a significant percentage of them are just me storing my code there. No one else is using them. Right. And if they're tiny little one-off scripts, you're not going to bother writing type hinting. And then the flip side of it happens as well. I've got a script that I would not, I've got a uh, repo that I would not put type hinting on that has type hinting because one of my colleagues went, oh, this is a great tool, but it needs type hinting. And he did a PR. So I'd get a (laughs) checkbox for that one, even though technically if it wasn't for him committing, it never would have had type hinting, right? So the data is going to be messy, but uh, there are some patterns there. It was kind of interesting. No, no, I agree. And the, the the more recent developments and kind of the more recent push for it kind of yeah they definitely align as far as like a a momentum um, which is interesting well i guess that digs us into topics this week and my first one is by uh, somebody i haven't mentioned his name in quite a while john fincher Uh, he was back on episode two where we were talking about learning python skills while creating games and guess what he has created another step-by-step project that is about a game. I like John's style. Um, I think it's really kind of fun, and I definitely uh, hope he continues to contribute to Real Python here and and create more stuff like this because uh, I think it's really interesting. And I always love to talk about projects. People know that by now. This one, the title of it is "Build a Hangman Game for the Command Line in Python," and so it's geared toward basics. People that are just learn the language and would like to create something and build it. And it's one of the more straightforward, here's the steps. But one of the things I really liked about it that I thought was really useful for somebody who's interested in maybe getting into game dev is there's this important step (laughs) initially where in the overview, you really should be formally describing your game and to like an nth degree, like go out and really think about like, okay, well, how do how, how do you set this game up? Like if you were thinking of like a board game, you know, like what are all the cards? What are all the little pieces? And what's the layout of everything? And, and going down and just really, really detailing it. Say you're describing it to somebody who can't see it. In this, he's describing that game setup, the number of players, the you're describing the role of the, the players have. In this case, they've named them the selecting player, the person who's sort of choosing the word that's going to be guessed and then the guesser and then you know how does word selection work and then as someone makes guesses you know, how does that work there's only a single letter at a time they can't repeat a letter how the word is shown with underscores under it and then the idea that the selecting person would 
in this case, draw this sort of scaffold that the hanging man comes from. There's also feedback when a guess happens. The selector, the person who, again, is choosing the word, would either put that letter in one of two places. Either it's going to be added to the right collection of the letters in the word, or it's going to then add a part to the hangman. And then kind of thinking about what the actual winning conditions are. If you do that and you go through and you really sort of think about the whole flow of this thing, it's going to help you with designing all the different elements, like what what becomes a function, what becomes sort of uh, your main variables that you're working with. And so I thought that was really kind of neat. And (laughs) I was listening to a podcast recently, was on LLMs, and one of the things that they said that I thought was an interesting sort of description of it was they like to kind of show off how smart they are. (laughs) And I'm like, well, all right, you're adding a little too much like sort of a humanness to that there. But it was an episode of Plain English with Derek Thompson, and they were describing kind of how they're using it. And again, just the amount of detail that you can provide, it will grab that and and really run and add all that kind of structure to it. So even if you're going to describe like a, a game or something like that, to think programmatically um, is still one of these really powerful kind of tools that you're learning as a, a beginner in learning Python. And so I think that's kind of neat thing that kind of tied that together. Okay, so then other things you need to think about, is this going to be two humans that are playing it? Is it is the computer controlling one of the signs? And uh, I always thought it might be interesting. You could kind of decide one way or the other as you run it. And and maybe that would be another interesting kind of wrinkle to programming it. So then he gets into the real steps of it after kind of getting into setting it up. There are these common elements of a game, the initial setup that we talked about. Then there's this loop that is always part of playing a game. And the gameplay loop has user input. You're then updating the state based upon that input. And then you check for your end game conditions to see if someone's won. And then you output the changes that reflect that current game state to all the players. And then, boom, you loop around. And then you then have to think about, like, how does the game end? So what are the prerequisites? What do you need to know to get into this? There's not a whole ton. If you understand the fundamentals of Python and don't even really need to import any additional stuff outside the built-in library. I think there's like you're maybe importing random or something like that at most. You're going to work with files and you'll need to work with files using a a context statement with with and you'll need to practice using input, the input function and kind of cleaning that data. You'll need to understand functions, while versus for loops and conditionals to check the conditions one way or the other and then, you know, the basics of strings, lists and And then sets are kind of a unique thing here that is a very useful data structure for what we're working with with letters here and not having two versions of an individual letter. So step one, you set up the project. You actually do a lot of working with the words right there. And one nice feature of this particular step-by-step project is he provides a word list as text in there. And you can always download the code. That's a really common thing now for all of our step-by-step projects that if you want to download the code you can directly from from the article. There's a link in there, but also very often they'll have the code right on the screen and you can show and hide it and copy it out of there if that works faster for you. You're going to work with that word list and how to sort of structure that. In step two, you're having it select a word out of that. That's where you're importing choice from the random built-in module there. And then it's doing read lines and stripping out a particular word for you to be able to choose from there. And step three, you're going to then look at the player's input and validate its input. There's certain very specific checks it needs to do. It needs to have exactly one character has been entered. It's going to shift the input to be lowercase so that it's it's not going to have a mix of capital and lowercase letters. And then the input, make sure the letter isn't something that the person's already guessed. Display the guest letter and the word, put it in the two different places we talked about earlier. And then step five is like drawing the hangman. And one nice thing is there's, a again, another shared text snippet that's right there for you to help you out with a list of text strings that'll show in the terminal that are in, in literally in a list so that you don't have to 
come up with some other kind of way of doing it. So that'll save you a little bit of time as far as creating that. You use indexing in that list to basically choose what level of guesses have gone. And then step six is to check is the game over. Step seven then goes back over and runs the whole loop again. It's not really that long. It's a pretty straightforward project, which I liked about it. And what I think is neat about it is there's a whole bunch of like sort of things that you could do with this from here. Again, if you're just getting past the basics, just standing this up and playing it, it's kind of fun. Again, you can choose to maybe make it to humans that are playing it, or you could set it up to have a CPU, you know, the way that it's set up in this particular example, computer player acting as the selector of the words. I thought it might be fun for you to select a word and have the CPU guess. That might be a little more advanced. So the other thing I thought, so there's a article by Leo Donis that just came out, which is uh, on the game of life, which okay. really isn't, which isn't a game, right? But it does use curses to update the text on the screen in a continuous fashion. So you could go off and do read that project because again, that's one of those step by step projects, and you could take those things you learned about curses and bring it back to the hangman so that instead of it being a scrolling piece, it could be in place and update the screen as you went, which would be a nice little sort of advance your uh, your 2E type stuff as you went. Yeah, I was thinking about that too, because I, I mentioned before uh, another project that this was, I think was from Garana, that was the Wordle clone that used Python and Rich. And so again, kind of that 2E idea. So you could take some ideas from that and again, kind of prettify it, because this is really basic looking. It's not really any color. And then there's a bunch of other next steps in the article itself that actually discuss other CLI projects, like command line stuff, like you know, make a dice rolling application or a quiz application and build like a weather thing and, and so forth. And all these could be used to enhance this project and kind of bounce back and forth. And I think there's a recent one also that talked about like, well, how could you make it be online and use something like PyScript? So lots of sort of jumping off points to kind of go to the next level. I just want to thank John for creating another fun step-by-step -step project. But John started mentoring through the program that Martin set up near the really beginning of the pandemic. It was one of the things I mentioned, I think it was episode three. And I think he's still out there doing that mentoring, which is great. And I think that's taking away from him being able to do writing. So I look for, forward to more projects from him and in the future if he's up for it. What's your first one here? Uh, well, I've actually got a pair of articles which kind of okay. touch on related topics. A bit of context first for anyone who isn't a Django person. Django has a module built in that's called the Django Admin. It's a web interface to the ORM, which is itself an interface to the database. So, for example, if I have a person object with a first and last name field, in the ORM that maps to the person table in the database. And with a little extra code, I can I get a page in the admin that allows me to create, update, and delete people. So it, it's a quick interface to the database and your objects. Yeah. The admin's been around pretty much since the beginning, uh, it, and but it was never meant as a customer-facing tool. More of a used by the administrators to tweak something on the back end. Right. Because this is its target audience, it's, um, well, let's just say it fell out of the ugly tree and hit every branch on the way down. <laughs> okay. So, which leads me to the first of the two articles. It is titled, Why is the Django Admin Ugly? And it's by Vince Salvino. The post is a bit of a story by Vince talking about how he frequently ends up having conversations about the admin at conferences Things like, why is the UI so dated? Which is a polite way of saying ugly. Uh, why hasn't it changed? There are quotes around all these words you're using yes. in the article. Uh, yes. Ugly is quoted. quoted and dated right. is quote we're, unquote. We're very careful. Yeah. <laughs> it's an opinion, obviously. Yes. So why hasn't it changed in years? Uh, why doesn't it have some specific feature, right? So these are frequent topics that he's finding that he's having when he's, you know, dis discussions he's having at the conferences. Right. So being faced with this question, he decided to dig around a bit and come up with some answers, one of which is actually right in the documentation. There's a, there's a quote in the documentation that says, the admin's recommended use is limited to an organization's internal management tool. It's not intended for building your entire front end around. Yes. So th there's a sort of a very strong statement of intent there. Yeah. So after digging around some more, Vince found the ultimate answer, and that that's a one-word answer: fill. <laughs> so. <laughs> 
evidently the Django admin was built for a gentleman named Phil Cathon. He was the editor at the online part of the Lawrence Journal World newspaper, which is the place that first built Django as a CMS tool. The admin was built for internal users who needed to make a quick fix and it was never intended as a front facing for, you know, a front facing app. So it kind of made me wonder as I read the story, I was like, I wonder how often there's like somebody's name buried at the bottom of some decision, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. You come along, it's like, why is that Bob? That's why. Why is that Jane? That's why. <laughs> so at least with this one, now we know it's Phil's fault. So personally, I'd like to thank Phil. Ugly or otherwise, the Django admin has saved me from writing a ton of code. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's uh, wonderful that it exists. And that leads me to another Django admin article. This one is by Matthias Gestenholz. It's titled, Customize the Django Admin to Differentiate Your Environments. This is actually something I've done. Uh, the idea is you include a visual indicator of what environment a project is running within. So for example, different colors in your nav bar to mean dev, testing, staging, or production. Oh, big clues where you're at right now. <laughs> exactly, right? And, and as the Django admins an internal facing tool, you can get away with it not being, say, the site's branded colors because it's an internal facing tool. So being someone who once accidentally shut down a production server because I forgot which window was which terminal, I appreciate these kinds of visual clues. Yeah, I won't go into the details, uh, but if uh, the article does explain how to modify the CSS using the theming feature added in Django 3.2. So even if you aren't a Django person, this is a great idea. I personally even do it with my terminals. I have a separate themed terminal that I use when I log into a remote box mm. to sort of remind me, oh, right, you're in that place that, you know, <laughs> you may actually damage something. Okay. So if you use Django, check out the article. And if you don't use Django, you should steal the idea. I think it's a, it's a powerful, very simple one, but a powerful one. Yeah, I think anybody who's worked in publishing <laughs> is should be pretty happy with the quality of this sort of the CMS side of the content management system that, that the admin potentially presents. Oh, it, it's a powerful tool. It does exactly what you need it to. Yeah. It just isn't. It's just not pretty. Yeah, exactly. Doesn't look like a magazine glossy like right, most right. websites do now. Yeah. Yeah. Don't go behind stage at a concert either. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, it's it's also a part of it too is it's very web 1.0. So, yeah, yeah, very much. So, uh, yeah. Everything is a link. You click the link, and it opens a new page. And uh, you know, right. if you've, if you're, if you're a youngin, and you're used to React and Angular, and you know, oh, I can drag and drop, and I can do this and that. It's not it there, yeah. and so uh, <laughs> it can be a bit of a shock to the system the first time you see it. Yeah, definitely. Cool. So my next one ties into the conversation I had with Adam Johnson. We talked about improve your Git DX, your sort of Git developer experience. And uh, that was episode 179. So just a few back. And I mentioned in that Julia Evans and her zine, Oh Shit Git, which was, you know, trying to help you <laughs> dig out of a problem that you might have dug yourself into. And Julia online is at Bork, which is B0RK. The blog post that she wrote is titled Confusing Git Terminology. I'll just read what she starts out with. Hello, I'm slowly working on explaining Git. One of my biggest problems is that after almost 15 years of using Git, I've become very used to Git's idiosyncrasies and it's easy for me to forget what's confusing about it. So I asked people on Mastodon, what Git jargon do you find confusing? Thinking of writing a blog post that explains some Git's weirder terminology. And I really appreciate the level of research that she went into into this post. There's lots of solid links that that really dive deeper into this if the short explanation that Julia gives isn't really clearing it up for you. But I thought it was really kind of interesting. I'm not the biggest Git pro, and I think that partly has to do with the fact that i am either been on really small teams or mostly worked on <laughs> my own stuff. And so I think in a larger organization is where things get more interesting as far as like branching and all this sort of stuff. But there are a lot of kind of odd choices in the naming of things. A lot of symbols used that are really lead to the confusion if you're not looking close. So like the first one is 
is head versus head. And so again, right away, I have to tell you what I mean by that. Lowercase h-e-a-d is a branch, whereas all caps head, h-e-a-d, <laughs> is the current branch. Every branch has its head, whereas capitalized all letters is the current one. So that could be, again, visually kind of confusing. There's another one that she ties into that is <laughs> it has like a capitalized head with a carrot, capitalized head with a tilde, capitalized head with two carrots, <laughs> and so forth. And you can check and again, read this article and you can kind of learn more about what that means. There's this warning you may have seen, which is a fun thing to read, the detached head state. And so this a warning that will pop up, um, you are in, quote, detached head state. You can look around, make experimental changes and commit them. And, and you can discard any commits. Anyway, it's basically, it's going to be without impacting any branches by switching back to a branch. So this is letting you know that you're not currently working on capital head state. And you either need to create a new branch or switch back to an existing branch. So there's this terminology that's two periods or three periods. So dot, dot, or dot, dot, dot. And that's a little kind of confusing. Um, so like you could have git log main dot, dot, test or git log main dot, dot, dot. So two dots, three dots. And it has to do with kind of how far down you are as far as the amount of commits. Is it like two commits? Um, are you committing C and D? Or are you committing B, C, and D? And anyway, it, it again, can get really kind of confusing. So there's a lot of these interesting little ideas. Index, staged, and cached all sort of refer to the same thing. And similarly, reset, revert, and restore are very similar. So it's kind of a little hard to differentiate them. And so she kind of gets into describing it. She says, I think it's made worse because git reset dash dash hard and git restore period on their own do basically the same thing. And then she gets into the differentiations between them. So lots of really interesting stuff there. A little confusion on a term called ref log, R-E-F-L-O-G. Some people thought it was reflog, <laughs> which is kind of fun. And the reference log is gives you this history of everything as a reference that has ever been pointed to. And it can really help you get out of really sticky uh, situations. I think her other book kind of dives into that much, much more detailed. Something like you've accidentally deleted a branch um, that was important. And then she notes that it's one of the more confusing parts of, of Git's UI. And she tries to avoid needing to use it. And we talked about it in a little more detail and mentioned some tools with my conversation with Adam Johnson. The terms push and pull are kind of odd. You know, if you're familiar with a pull request, it, it isn't the same wording in other systems. The idea is that you are requesting somebody else to pull your code that you've sort of committed and merge it into their stuff. So maybe merge request would be better than pull request. It's kind of a weird semantical meaning, but it's a really pretty detailed post. It goes into lots of these terms. I think it helps clear up some of the confusion you might have between these kind of odd terms. I don't run into all of these terms often. There were a bunch of that where I was like, okay, I haven't seen that before. And I guess it kind of depends on what, what you're working into. But I want to thank Julie for the resource, and I'm looking forward to checking out the book. Uh, she's a really good follow on Mastodon, so I'll include the link for that there. If you do follow her, that might be a good way to get a chance to participate in one of her surveys. Dan, what, are you any terms that <laughs> mess with you on in Git? And so Git for me is like regexes. I, I know enough yeah. to do the stuff that I do regularly, and everything else is go Google it. Yeah. And like you, you know, for the last few years, I've been mostly working either in small projects or independent. Uh, like I, I, I don't necessarily even use a feature branch. I can get away with that if it's just me, right? right. Just move forward, <laughs> uh, commit. <laughs> the other thing, uh, you know, that makes all this messier too is not only is that there are all these problems with the terminology, but there's also uh, conventions and different organizations will use different conventions. Yeah. Uh, so there's sort of an ongoing debate on the internet as to whether or not you should squash or rebase when you're uh, doing branch merges. And so if you're used to working one way and then you go to another organization and, it, and they're used to working the other, you're 
may not have data that you're expecting to have or the data <laughs> yeah. the, the data that you are expecting to be there it, it, there's too much data because you're used to it going away and so like you, you know it, it's a complex enough tool to begin with and then the fact that you know everybody sort of mucks with it slightly differently kind of makes that uh, uh, just that much harder to grasp yeah this week i want to shine a spotlight on another real python video course and this course just went live this week and is very timely for the holidays. It's titled Advent of Code, Solving Puzzles with Python. It's another real Python code conversation. This one is two former guests of the show and real Python team members, Garana Hiela and Philip Exeni. Garana takes Philip through the process of solving a couple of Advent of Code puzzles using Python. And through the course, you'll learn what an online Advent calendar is, how solving puzzles can advance your programming skills, how to sign up and participate in the advent of code, how to break down a programming puzzle, how to iterate your solution and refactor your code to reuse for later problems within the puzzle set. Working through and solving advent of code and other online puzzles are a great way to hone your Python skills and even develop some new ones. If you're looking for a challenge or perhaps looking for some assistance on how to approach solving puzzles with Python, I think this is a great investment of your time. Real Python video courses are broken into easily consumable sections, and where needed, include code examples for the techniques shown. All lessons have a transcript, including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the enhanced search tool on realpython.com. So what's your next one? I've got an article called Let's Make a Silly JSON-Like Parser, and it's by Arun Mani. Uh, right up front, the article explains that it's more about building a parser of something uh, rather than being, say, the best solution for JSON. Okay. Uh, his approach isn't particularly fast, but if you've never written a parser before, it's a good intro to how they work. The article starts by explaining the JSON format and just what kinds of tokens you can expect in the data being parsed. He names the parser Jason with an A, like Jason and the Argonauts or, you know, demigod of the water, Jason Momoa, and explains that it's never a good idea to name your Python file the same thing as a module in the standard library. Uh, badness ensues. So yeah. don't call this thing JSON, J-S-O-N dot pi. It will mess things up. The code starts out by creating a data reading class that uses an end of file indicator rather than the index error. And uh, so if your accessing data goes past the end point, you'll get this EOF instead of uh, an exception. He then combines this with the file seek function to implement access on the data file. The intent here is to have a similar interface when reading a file versus reading a string. And you use seek because when you read something, it moves the file pointer and you might need to move it back depending on how you're parsing things. Okay. And so once he's got this kind of base file reading class in place, he then builds the string equivalent using the same kind of API so that you can very quickly swap back and forth between the two ideas. The core part of the algorithm is a recursive parser. It looks for specific constants like brace brackets, and it tries to figure out what parsing functions to call based on the tokens. There is a parsing function for, say, general data, lists, nulls, numbers, etc., and all the bits and pieces of JSON are there. That's JSON without the A, sorry, Mr. Momoa. The rest of the article is the implementation of each of those parsing functions, and you can follow along or you can grab the code from GitLab. And while I'm on the topic, I love the footer on Arun's page. It has three proclamations. The website is free of ads and tracking. It proudly runs on electricity. And no generative AI is at work on the site. So <laughs> as the curator of PyCoders, I have to wade through a lot of badly written articles that appear to be written by machines. Uh, so it makes my heart beat a little faster to know that there's still some folks out there doing it the old-fashioned way. Yeah. So if you want to learn a little more about Jason or uh, you want to learn how parsers work, this is a good, good resource for you. I like the other little note. Check out RSS. All cool kids use it. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, uh -huh. RSS. All right. Well, okay, I think that takes us into our discussion this week. 
one of the things we try to do in most of the PyCoders newsletters is uh, link to some sort of discussion about Python. And as you might imagine, I've got a bunch of bookmarks for sites where Python gets discussed. And if I see something I think folks would find interesting, I put it in the newsletter. Frequent source of these links are the discussion boards at python.org. There's a whole bunch of them. One of the more interesting ones is called Ideas. And it's a place where you can say, I'd like it if Python would X. And then people discuss the idea. You have to have a bit of a thick skin because someone is inevitably going to say, that's a horrible idea. What's wrong with you? Uh, it's generally <laughs> fairly it's generally fairly polite, but it is still the internet. Uh, the core maintainers do hang out here. So you will even occasionally see one of them say, hey, that's a great idea. I'll sponsor it if you want to write up the pep. So these kinds of boards are great ways for the community to feed ideas into the language. And it, you know, it's not, a, it's not a special thing. You just create an account and pop up your idea and see how whether or not other folks think it's good. So in the last couple of issues of PyCoders, we've linked to two different ideas discussions. The first of which is titled An Idea to Allow Implicit Return of Named Tuples. And it was posted by Sanskar Jethi. So consider when you want to return multiple values from a function. Typically, the way you do that now is you stuff them in a tuple. Uh, what this idea proposes is the ability to use named arguments in that returned tuple and have a named tuple automatically created instead of the vanilla one. So there's a real Python article called Write Pythonic Clean Code with Named Tuples by Leodonos Pozzo-Ramos. And one of the bits in there is the fact that returning a named tuple is more indicative of what the results are. So uh, consider a function that does division. Uh, you want to return both the quotient and the remainder. You could stick that in a tuple. But if you stick it in a named tuple, that means you get a very clear answer about which is the quotient and which is the remainder. So Sanskar's idea is that instead of having to define a named tuple explicitly, you could just return named arguments. So the return result from that same function would say quotient equals two, comma, remainder equals zero. And instead of getting a tuple back, you'd get an automatic named tuple on the fly. I kind of like this one. It's kind of interesting. What do you think? Um, it's interesting because like normally you might think, okay, but aren't you, couldn't you use keywords? And in that case, keyword arguments are for use within the function, not really what's being returned out of the function. And so it's kind of a way to kind of think of it in that, in that sense. Yeah, it's keyword, it's keyword arguments on the way out. Yeah. <laughs> keyword arguments are usually on the way in. So yeah, this yeah. Is, yeah. It's different. It's, it's a way of returning with keyword arguments, essentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so that, I mean, you know, I, I, I think that's an interesting idea. I don't know. I, I haven't run into this where I'm like, oh gosh, I really, really need this. And so I, do you feel like it's going to provide, like it would in, uh, effectively like shorten parts of your code by having this? Like it's going to make certain things easier? I think what it would do is encourage you by default okay. to use named tuples as the response instead of a regular tuple. Okay. So if I'm writing a function like that division example that I was thinking about, uh, which, by the way, exists in the standard library, so I should never be writing it, but ignore that fact. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> right. but if I was writing a function like that, the unless you're trying to be like really careful about typing uh, or you're trying to, you know, or whether it's unclear to the user, you often don't, until, unless you're like passing objects around a lot of the time, you're often, there's a lot of situations where you're like, oh, this could be an object, but I could just stick it in a tuple and return it. And that's good enough. So there's an extra step, an extra, I guess, mental process that you have to go through of saying, hey, a named tuple would be useful here. So by having it automatic by the compiler, I think I might use it more often simply because I don't have to think about it. I don't have to create the name tuple somewhere else. And it, it, like, it could kind of become your default right. way of returning something from the function. So, you know, is it necessary? Uh, you know, it'll, it saves one line of code. <laughs> so, like, it's, it's not an optimization that way. But I think it would... It might encourage people to do this, which I think is a good practice, more because it makes it easy. Yeah. Having more definitively named things. Yeah, I don't know. That's interesting. Like I, 
it's it's funny how like these idea things we'll talk about the next one you know coming up they want to share it in the simplest terms and very often it's so generic that you're not necessarily getting the value out of it i i think like literally his return statements are like name one equal one and name two <laughs> equal two and it's just like you so like you know just glancing at it you're like that's really useful and descriptive you know it's like i i wish it was a little more described it's like the foobar thing that i'm not a big fan of either i, I yeah like, give I, me a little more in your idea it's funny you said that because that was a, that was the first thing that came to my mind is you know we've we've had conversations in the past and, and it, you see it in technical writing all the time of you know foo and bar and it's like okay you're showing me the syntax but you know and and you know this is why I kind of dug into uh, the Adonis's article there in my reference because you know I kind of remembered I'm like I think he did it with something with division and I went and I looked it up because yeah. that's an actual example right I'm right, getting right, two right. values back and I I want to name the one quotient and right, name the other remainder so that it's clear. And that can be helpful. I, I think what ends up happening in a lot of these idea spaces is you'll get a, you know, I'm writing code in a certain way. If if the language had X, it would mean it would be easier for me. Right. Streamline my process. It, right. Because that, cause that's what it is. It always comes down to scratching an itch, right? Right. You know, I've never gotten around to writing it up. But one of the things that I've always kind of wondered about, and I'm not exactly even what the syntax would look like, but... All the time when you create objects, you end up with this boilerplate code inside of an init yeah. where you end up with self dot self dot quotient equals from the argument, self dot remainder equals from the argument. And it feels to me like there should be like a, a, a single line, a built in or something that automatically creates all of the self dot whatevers on the object yeah. from the keyword arguments of the init because 90% of the time that's what you end up doing. I mean, that was super confusing to me learning the language and and not having done a ton of object oriented stuff before. You look at it and you go, what is this sort of gibberishy repeated yeah. words one after another? Why would self equal self? Like, duh, it should. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so sometimes it's just kind of confusing um, in, in the way it's set up. So I agree that, that that would be a streamlining. So, but the thing is, like, that's something because I spend a lot of time in the Django space and because the objects are using uh, data class style objects before data classes were invented, you end up with a lot of code that looks like this. So I might post an idea like this and 80% of the Python community might go, I never touched this. Why are Shrug. you complaining? <laughs> what, whatever. Like, why would you want this? And you're creating these other complications and and then what do you name the function so that it's clear what it does? And so like, there's all these kinds of things that, you know, you're inevitably what happens in, on these idea boards is you're going, hey, I'm itchy. This is how I think I want to scratch it. Right. And sometimes you get, a, oh, that's that's an itch we all have. That's great. I, this analogy is going horribly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I think it's, some fanta- <laughs> it, 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 it's fantastic that we have this space where you can kind of have this conversation. Right. And, and, you know, it's um, Python is sometimes known as the language that's second best at everything. And, and one of the reasons it's so popular is because it's in so many different places. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't spend a lot of time in the data science space. So there are going to be use cases that are boilerplate in data science that I would never think about. Um, you know, I, I, and you, even if you, <laughs> at risk of sounding, <laughs> bringing up old cranky things, the walrus operator is one of those things, right? I remember right. it being announced and I kind of went, eh, whatever, I shrugged. I'm like, I, I'm not against it. If somebody else thinks it's useful, great, good for you. Uh, I've never used it, right? But obviously there was enough of a desire <laughs> from, either from people coming from other languages or they're writing code in a different style than I am that they're like, yes, yes, we need this, right? Yeah. And the idea behind these boards is uh, this is somewhere you can go and discuss it and you'll find out whether or not others have uh, similar problems. I like the stats post right below the the initial sort of idea. It, you know, it shows who created it. It has all these kind of nice little statistics, like when was the last reply? How many replies were there? Yeah, it's just a feature of the discussion board. So you get that yeah. on all of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's nice. And then it's how many views does it has? So like how hot is it, if you will? And yep. then overall users. And so I, I, I think that's useful to kind of go, oh, this is a discussion I should probably, you know, check out. Or I, I 
you know, I recognize some of the avatars of these people that are involved or whatever. Well, the, so the other aspect of too is, you know, Python's been around for a long time. So there's a good chance whatever idea you've come up with, someone has already there might have been a pep for it. It might yeah. have been turned down for a reason. And so rather than going through the effort of trying to write this up formally and try to get a sponsor and all the rest of that, you can brain fart to the idea board and somebody can go, yep, that's pipe th- that's pep three, three, four, five, go look at it. It got rejected and this is why, right? So yeah. I, I'm just making numbers up. I couldn't tell you what pep three, four, five <laughs> was. Okay. So just so we're clear. So I don't, we don't get angry letters about, but three, four, five was accepted. Anyways, right. uh, so <laughs> let, let's move on to the other one that we talked about, which is uh, a post recently done by Joshua Bambrick and it's entitled Syntactic Sugar to Encourage the Use of Named Arguments. So this is kind of the, it's it's actually kind of a bit of an echo. It's almost a similar idea, but it's on the way in. Right. So this is, what Joshua rightly points out is that you frequently end up with variables that have the same name as the argument that you're populating in the call to a function. And Django RM example that I kind of talked about earlier does this all the time, right? So I've got a person object needs a first and last name field. And if I'm grabbing the data from, say, JSON, I'm, I'm full of callbacks today, yep. uh, then uh, I'd likely keep that data in variables named first and last. So you end up with person, first name equals first name, person, a comma, last name equals last name. So Joshua is proposing that to save some typing, you could use a equal sign as a prefix on the variable in that function call, and the name value pair would automatically use the same name as the value as a quick little shortcut. In the discussion of the post, someone mentions that this kind of happens sort of like this inside of an F string already, where there's you can put equal on the end of the variable name in the F yeah. string, and it will show some debug information. And they sort of said, hey, I love this idea, but we should put the equals on the end instead of at the beginning, and then it would be consistent with the F string. So what did you think of this one? This one, I, I kind of agree with parts of it. I kind of also like some of the points that some other people put out, like, again, like going back to the, you know, naming things maybe more explicitly and, and, and so forth, the repeated of the name, you know, especially if it's like a a certain length, you know, or common things, people like X equals X and Y equals Y, you know, Um, I think it's, it's interesting, and I, I think this idea, I, I agree with it a little more than I do the other one, having done a little more of it, but at the That's same time... That's funny, I'm the other I, way around. I, uh, what's that? I said it's funny, I'm the other way around. The other way around, okay, yeah. This yeah. one, I, I um, it's not like a feature that I'm like, oh gosh, that would save me so much time. I feel like for some people... It, it, it sounds like that. That's like so, such a common thing for them. But I'm, I'm more like, like if I was putting in like temperature equals or you know whatever and then it's like value in f is what i would have my variable name i would i I would have more description of my variables but that's just me you know wanting to again make it more readable i think somebody talked about that in in this list this one has i think a lot more views and a lot more sort of activity i think you actually had somebody i think actually guido chimed in which i thought was interesting and said, well, if you want to write this up and, and so forth, I'd, I'd be willing to this, to look at sponsoring it, which I think is interesting. So it's cool to see the machine kind of working behind all this and, and see what happens. And I, I want to know how the sausage is made. Well, <laughs> visit this board. That's how the sausage is made. Yeah. Yeah, you will. Yeah. yeah. How the peps uh, are made. Yeah, totally. I, I'm not against this one. Uh, yeah. I think it's an interesting idea. Uh, I'm always... Uh, I'm a little more cautious with any syntax that shortcut syntax tends to be harder for new programmers. Right. Right. That's the problem with both of these. And I, and I, I, I I hate, uh, so the other one in my mind, it seems explicit because you're actually writing it out. Whereas this one, you have to know what that equal sign does. And and so, you know, go back to the walrus operator example, right? Like if you now you have to go, oh, what? I've never seen colon equals. What is that? And you have to pay attention that, oh, there was a colon in front of it. And don't get me wrong, that doesn't make it a, a bad thing. And I'm always cautious about slippery slope arguments. Uh, you go down far enough down this path, you end up writing Perl, right? And that's, I don't understand this, even though I wrote it myself. Right. 
so the the challenge with shortcuts is you know it, it, for developers who are typing a lot it helps for developers who are new to the language now you're having to go oh wait a second what's that symbol and what does it do right and if it happens to end up being something that isn't used as often then you're into that okay i got to look this up and relearn this kind of thing and that doesn't that's not I'm not, I don't feel strongly enough about it to say, no, this shouldn't happen. Um, but that's, that was kind of the, the, the niggle, right? That was, that was the yeah. little voice I heard. Yeah. I don't know if I would yeah. use it either yeah. in, in some ways. Cause I feel like, you know, in the space that I'm in, it's, it's not as, like you said, explicit, you know, like what it's doing. As much as it concerns me a little bit, cause it's a shortcut, it, I would probably end up using it a lot because, uh, again, that whole ORM yeah. data class kind of space, you end up with this pattern a lot. Lots of keywords. Um, yeah. yeah. So, well, okay. I, it'd be interesting to see if either of these get turned into peps. Uh, yeah. and either way, uh, how far they go. <laughs> yeah. And either way, kudos to Sanskar and Joshua for participating in the community and, you know, generating good conversations about this. So, right. Uh, it's, uh, it's always nice to see it happening. I think that takes us right into projects. My project this week is, I think I've used this phrase too much this week, but um, it's very straightforward. It's a script and it does what it li is listed on the tin. It's called Grab Links. And the subtitle is Extract Links from a Remote HTML Resource. It's from Christian Rosentretter. He goes by The Real Tokai. So Christian set this up it requires just a couple fairly common requirements for something like this. You might have might even guess them right away, which is requests and beautiful soup. To get this going, you set up a virtual environment and then you pip install the requirements text file and you're ready to go. So again, it's designed to extract or basically pull down links from whatever HTML page that you're looking for. You can filter those results. You can use a single word like a search term or you can use regular expressions if you like which uh, might hint to something that's coming up soon and you can also use features from beautiful soup things like class attributes or elements so if you're familiar with that tool you can use that to access very specific parts of a page or different again attributes or elements that are inside of it it has a few arguments that are in there or flags that are documented in the readme a couple examples are provided in there it just works. It was really simple, and I like that about it as far as the you know straightforwardness of it. I think, again, this is a nice sort of jumping off point for maybe your own personal project. Maybe try building it yourself or try recreating it, you know, or you could just go ahead and fork it. Maybe you want to add a GUI to it. Maybe you'd like it to prettify the output uh, or save the output in a file. Maybe you want it to be marked down make some sort of preview system would be kind of interesting too to maybe see what the, the links all look like. So you could definitely make a much more elaborate version of this script CLI with not too many steps. I think it's something you could jump jump ahead. So I found it as a, a useful sort of jumping off project that I wanted to share. I did find a small issue and uh, I'd, I'd be intrigued to see other people do find it. So what's your project? So my project this week isn't my, so much a project as a website. It's built by Ole Michelson, and it's called the RegX Crossword. It's a site to help you practice with regular expressions. And how it works is each page consists of one or more expressions and some number of fields laid out like a crossword puzzle. So for example, the first tutorial puzzle has two empty spots that you can fill in with either the letter A or B. And then along the spots are the regexes. Horizontally, it shows A+, plus, while vertically, it shows A bar B. The only solution that solves both directions is A in the first spot and A in the second spot. So you drag and drop letter tiles into the empty spots to fill them in with what you think the solution is. And if you make a mistake along the way that violates one or more of the regexes, then the square turns a dark red to show you that it's incorrect. You can then fix it by dragging another letter in, replacing the one you've got. So once you've filled in all the squares without violating any of the regexes, you've solved the puzzle. So it's a cool idea. Uh, lets you play around with your understanding of regexes with, within sort of a sufficiently constrained environment that you can see what's working and what isn't. All told, there are almost 100 puzzles for you to play with. And if you dig around on Ole's site, there's also a mobile version of this in case you want to, say, test your regex knowledge while commuting. He also has a donation page. So if you like, you can buy him a coffee or something. 
the he's color coded the puzzle difficulty level. I'm a little suspicious that this might cause some issues with colorblind folks. I quick tested with my colorblind simulator and didn't they all worked, but I only tested a couple of them. So there's a chance uh, that that might be problematic for some people. But that's uh, a little bit of a, a maybe. So if, if you are colorblind, you might need a little extra help or some hints or something to see how what's working, what's not working. But I think the shading on it's strong enough to be good. But otherwise, a uh, neat little tool. And uh, if you like the puzzle stuff and you like playing with the Rec-Xs, it's definitely worth checking out. Yeah, it, you definitely can scale up pretty quickly. And you have a nice course that people can follow along to maybe get back to understand the syntax. <laughs> there's a, a little bit in the tutorial, but there's so many little syntactical things that would be useful to know before you, you dive right into the puzzles if you have to be uh, reminded. Yes, and speaking of the sausage being made, uh, one of those things that happens when you generate as many courses as you and I do, uh, you go through, you do some research, you build the course, and then you sometimes forget an awful lot of it. So just because my name's on that <laughs> does not mean I remember any of it. Uh, we frequently get questions on that course, and a couple of my colleagues are, are way faster at answers than I am. I'm like, yeah, I, I know I wrote that, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Well, thanks, Christopher, for bringing all these articles and projects this week. Always fun to be here. All right. Talk to you soon. I want to thank Christopher Trudeau for coming on the show again this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.